Good morning, church, and welcome to worship. I am glad that you are here, especially to anyone who's logging on for the very first time. If you've never worshiped with us before, welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Pastor Whitney Sheridan, and I'm so glad to, to worship with each and every one of you this Sunday morning. Please take a moment to fill out our Connect card. I will show you a QR code. I'll throw a link in the chat box if you're watching live with us on Sunday morning. Please, please, please take a moment to fill that out. It lets us know who's here, who's watching, and most importantly, how we can connect with you and how we can be praying for you. So please take a moment to fill that out. And as you're doing so, I'd like to remind you that next week we will be back, fingers crossed and weather uh, weather permitting, we will be on the front lawn of our St. Anthony Park Church building uh, to worship outside and worship in person. So next week, please join us at 10 a.m. on the St. Anthony Park Church lawn uh, for worship together. Bring your own communion elements so we can celebrate communion safely and yet together. And remember Jesus among us and Jesus with us and Jesus for us. Friends, we are in the middle of our summer sermon series that we're calling It's Bright Out Here. And it's all about kind of what it's like for us as we emerge out of kind of the past year and a half where we experience so much isolation, so much separation. And as we're coming together, we're finding, you know, ourselves a little rusty, right? It's weird to be back in so many ways. Um, and, and it still feels kind of like we, we're not really stepping into exactly how it was. Amen. We're stepping into something new, uh, but we're finding ourselves a little weird, a little rusty. And so we are walking alongside the new baby church, um, the early church as Paul and Peter and the apostles are writing letters um, that we find at the end of our New Testament. So after the four gospels, we've got these letters, the epistles, they're called. And we're walking through those and kind of seeing where we can identify and what we can learn from the new church as they're stepping into a new reality and as we are stepping into a new New reality. Before we get into our lesson for today, let's take a moment, friends, to pray. Holy and loving and gracious God, I would ask that what needs to be said be said this day, and what needs to be heard may it truly be heard. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said, Amen. Well, friends, we've been walking through um, our our letters, our epistles, and last week we talked about uh, 1 Thessalonians, this book um, to the church in Thessalonica, rhymes with harmonica, and we are learning that this is a small community, but they're doing really, really well. They're, they're living together as community, and 1 Thessalonians was all about Paul kind of praising them and, and, and giving them a good, like, rah, 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 you're doing it, because they are coming together, they're living together, they're working hard um, to be community that lifts one another up, that strengthens one another. And it's all in anticipation of the second coming of Jesus Christ, right? Jesus died um, on a cross. He was put in a tomb. He was raised on Easter morning. Um, and then there was the ascension, right? He ascends back into heaven saying like, BRB, I'll be right back. Um, but that's the big question mark is when will Jesus come back? And Paul, who's writing the majority of these letters that we find at the end of our New Testament, Paul really believed that that um, returning of Jesus was imminent. It was going to come any time now. And so as he's going through these communities and preaching the gospel to them and raising them up in the faith and teaching them kind of these Christian traditions, um, teaching them how to be community, uh, you can definitely pick up that there are folks that, that are feeling that urgency, right? That are feeling that anticipation. And so they are wondering, you know, what is this second coming going to be like? Is it going to be confusing? Is it going to be violent? Is it going to be scary? Or is it going to be oh so good? Um, but how do we prepare for it? Because Paul keeps talking about how it's going to come like a thief in the night, right? It's going to be a surprise and a time that no one expects it to come. Um, so how do we prepare for that? So First Thessalonians was all about like you're doing it, right? It's living as community and, and doing all of the things and all the practices that it takes to live in good and just and healthy community. That's how we prepare ourselves for Jesus coming back. So now we have 2 Thessalonians, this next letter to the church in Thessalonica. Um, and uh, Paul is writing to this church and, and the issue that, um, they're experiencing now is, you know, they've been, they've been being church for, for a little bit. Um, and that second coming, uh, they're still waiting for it, right? And so this, uh, community has started to hear messages that, you know, the second coming, well, it already came and you missed it and you're still here, right? Um, things haven't changed for you. So there's this great big kind of, um, 
uh, not in their stomachs, right? There's this great big concern in the church in Thessalonica that they have missed the second coming. It has come and gone and they have missed out. So we're going to jump straight into what Paul has to say to the church in Thessalonica. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're going to read verses 1 through 5 and 13 to 17. So let's read together. Brothers and sisters, we have a request for you concerning our Lord Jesus Christ's coming and when we are gathered together to be with him. We don't want you to be easily confused in your mind or upset if you hear that the day of the Lord is already here, whether you hear it through some spirit, a message, or a letter supposedly from us. Don't let anyone deceive you uh, in any way. That day won't come unless the rebellion comes first and the person who is lawless is revealed who is headed for destruction. He is the opponent of every so-called God or object of worship and promotes himself over them. So he sits in God's temple, displaying himself to show that he is God. You remember that I used to tell you these things while I was with you, don't you? But we must always thank God for you, brothers and sisters who are loved by God. This is because he chose you from the beginning to be the first crop of the harvest. This brought salvation through your dedication to God by the Spirit and through your belief in the truth. God called all of you through our good news so you could possess the honor of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold on to the traditions we taught you, whether we taught you in person or through our letter. Our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father loved us and through grace gave us eternal comfort and a good hope. May he encourage your hearts and give you strength in every good thing you do or say. All right, so like I said, this letter kind of reveals uh, what Paul really thinks the second coming is going to be like, right? Paul thinks it's coming, and it's coming any time, but, but he also says it'll be marked. You, you know, you're uh, don't worry about missing it because you you shouldn't be able to miss it, right? It's going to bring about this huge kind of diff, um, shift in power structure. Um, large power structures and oppressive power structures will be torn down. And you can pretty, pretty pointedly see that... Um, or at least I think so, that he's talking about the Roman Empire, right? This, the Roman emperor who you were supposed to kind of, you were supposed to pray to, you were supposed to do offerings to, you were supposed to see the Roman emperor as, as divine, as God. So when he talks about, you know, there will be an evil one that's revealed, um, and that will be torn down, right? I, I would imagine that he, Paul must be talking about the Roman Empire. And, and according to Paul, what he really, really thinks the second coming is going to be like and feel like is seeing the destruction destruction of that Roman Empire. Um, so to the Thessalonian church, who is experiencing a pretty, pretty real um, sense of FOMO, right? Has any, have you all heard of that FOMO? Fear of missing out, right? They feel like they have missed out on the second coming. A little birdie has told them, oh, well, Jesus came and came and came and went and, oh, you didn't see it? Oh, he didn't come and see you? Oh, that's so weird. You know, they've received these other messages and they are starting to feel and kind of harbor this deep, deep, deep insecurity. Um, well, they have been doing all the right things. Even Paul said so. And if Jesus showed up, it didn't stop by their camp, right? Didn't come and get them to bring them and gather them up into heaven. Um, what does that say about them? Are they enough? Are they doing enough? And there's this sense of kind of hopelessness, I would imagine, um, sitting with the church in Thessalonica, if they truly felt like this Jesus had come and gone and they missed it. And so Paul's message to the church in Thessalonica, or Thessalonica um, is a reminder that, hey, 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 you didn't miss out on anything. And remember that you have been chosen by God. God loves you. Jesus died for you. Jesus' grace and forgiveness and salvation is for you. And God has instilled in you, in this community, the fruits of the Spirit that we've seen, faith and hope. And it's that hope, friends, that I want to spend a little time talking about and thinking about with all of you. And when we talk about hope, you know, it's really, really easy to consider hope and, and, and to hear hope as kind of this passive action. You know, well, well, we're doing our grind and we kind of hope, um, hope that things will change. We're just trying to like survive and make it and hope that something else will change or something else uh, will happen eventually. It sounds a lot, hope can sound a lot like waiting. 
right? We just sit and wait and hope. And friends, waiting can be excruciating. Excruciating. Um, I myself know this. I hate, hate, hate to wait. I was that kid who got in trouble all the time um, for opening Christmas presents early under the tree, right? I would sneak down in the middle of the night and like try to just peel up the tape or even kind of retape things if I tore anything um, to peek at my Christmas presents. To this day, my mother does not um, put any names on Christmas presents. She comes with, up with an elaborate code that she only reveals on the day that we're all kind of gathered together to open gifts. And that is because of me um, and how much I hated to wait. Um, lately or kind of over the past few years, I, I can identify with this excruciating sense of waiting as my husband and I, as AJ and I waited to hear um, or, or to, to meet our child, right? We've been in the, we've been in the adoption process for years, friends, and there was an, a process where, you know, you fill out all your paperwork and, and you're doing really, really active things. Um, and then you get it all done and all you have to do is wait. You have to sit and wait for a phone call. And friends, we were waiting for a phone call for years for years. And until the phone call kind of finally came that told us um, about our son Nehemiah coming into our lives, um, we hadn't received one phone call, like not a nibble, right? Um, it, oh my gosh. And it was, it was hard. It was a really, really hard and difficult season of our lives waiting to hear about our child, waiting in hope. And friends, there were definitely dark nights of the soul, I will tell you, where there was an overwhelming feeling of this is never going to happen. If we haven't received a phone call yet, then this is never going to happen. And there's something about that, right? There's something about like giving up or wanting to give up that feels like you're at least putting an end to the excruciatingness of waiting, right? Well, if we just give up, we can move on. We can move on with our lives and maybe it won't be so difficult. There, it's so tempting when you are waiting for something, when you are hoping for something, that temptation to just throw your hands in the air and move on, right? It it's a real temptation, amen? I'm wondering how many of you have ever kind of been in a place like that where you're waiting so long for something to happen um, and that temptation to say, well, maybe it just, maybe it's never going to happen. And friends, I wonder if that's how the people in that church in Thessalonica felt when they started to, you know, they've been waiting in hope, waiting for Jesus to come back. Um, and then they, you know, and, and, and they finally kind of heard that, well, maybe it did already. And maybe, maybe God isn't coming for us. Maybe Jesus isn't coming for us. Um, and we should just kind of give up, um, that it, the imminence of that second coming, right? Um, there was so much urgency in that. And I wonder how hard it made waiting. You know, Paul, Paul died and, and, and met Jesus in eternity before he saw Jesus come back to earth in the second coming, right? Jesus, or Paul definitely knew what it was like to kind of wait, um, wait in hope. And I'm sure that that was difficult for him sometimes. And friends, I think we, you know, and we are still waiting. The Christian community, this world is still 2000 years later waiting for Jesus to return. We are people who are defined by our waiting. We are people who are defined by this sense of living in hope. And the message from Paul to the Thessalonians, and I think the message of Paul to each of us, the message of our scripture today, is that there is strength in that hope. Paul defines um, kind of hope as a strength given to us from God at the ending of our scripture. Did you hear that? And it kind of points to this idea that hope is not as passive an action as we think, right? Hope is a deeply instilled faith. Hope is a deeply instilled feeling that gets us to the next day, even when we feel like we don't have anything left in us. I think hope is the very spirit of God living inside of us. It's what gets us up and out the door when we've got nothing left. It's, um, and we don't know why we even are doing it anymore. We don't know why we're waking up. We don't know why we're still hoping for this thing to still happen, but it, we still do. We still look for that change. We still hope for things to be different for us and, and for this world. 
Friends, hope is not a passive action. Hope is like the ax you use to break down the door in an emergency. It is the lifeline that requires all of us. And yet even after we're spent, it just keeps on chugging. Even if we don't feel it within us, it is still there and it is still working for change. Hope is the very thing that, that helps us look to the future. Hope is the very thing that helps us get out of bed in the morning. Hope is the very thing that God has put into us to strengthen us to live this life and this way of Jesus for our own transformation, for the transformation of the world. So friends, no matter how you find yourself today, no matter if you are, you are feeling the exhaustion of the weight, of the weight of what it's going to be like when we can finally get back together without fear of hurting one another with illness and sickness. Amen. When we can finally get to get to a point where we are thriving, where we are gathering, where we are creating new things again. Friends, it is coming and there is a future waiting for us out there and we have hope to wait. We have the strength to wait for that, to build towards that, to work towards that. And that hope is a strength given to us by God and it is going nowhere. So friends, thank you. Let us be thankful for this message from Paul. Let us be thankful for that reminder that God is constantly giving us everything that we need in this hope instilled in each and every one of us. Each and every one of you who are beloved, forgiven, saved, and set free by the grace of God in Jesus Christ. May we be thankful for that hope. May that hope flourish within us and help us thrive. And at the very least, may that hope be the thing that gets us to the next moment, to the next breath, to the next day, to our next place where God is leading us. So thanks be to God for hope today. And may we live as followers of Jesus, grateful and thankful for it. Thanks be to God. And amen.
cross as you wait for the crown Tell the world of the treasure you found And now friends, it is our time of offering. And I would invite you to give and give joyfully and make it be a prayer and an offering of hope. May we give joyfully to the ministries of Centennial United Methodist Church. We'll show you a text to give option as well as um, a, a QR code and I'll be sure to throw a link to our giving page in the chat if you're watching live with us on Sunday morning. Let us hope for a new future. Let us hope for all the things that this community can do and the impact it can make in our communities and in our lives. Thanks be to God. Amen. you to go. 
Go from this time and place of worship and may you go into this world full of hope, knowing that it is a strength given to you by God. Hope for change, hope for transformation, hope for love to run rampant throughout our hearts, our minds, our bodies, and our world. Go from this place, friends, to love and serve the Lord. And all God's people said, Amen.